Making your voice heard today is the final day of early voting for the May 2nd primary special election. From 1 until 5 this afternoon, you can cast your ballot. Thank you so much for joining us here on Face the State. I'm Tracy Townsend. Knowing your rights as a voter is critical in every election, primary, special, general. The League of Women Voters, which is a nonpartisan organization, is urging all voters to brush up on their rights and the state's new rules for voting in Ohio. Among the changes, voters must now present a photo ID when they cast ballots in person, either during early voting or on Election Day. You can use an Ohio driver's license, state ID, U.S. passport, passport card, military ID or interim identification issued by the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. The ID does not need to have your current address on it. Another part of the new law requires the BMV to place the word non-citizen, that label, on driver's licenses and state IDs of those who lack citizenship but are in the country legally. Nazak Hapasha, who is the policy affairs manager of the League of Women Voters, told me they're working to get people prepared to vote in all elections. We are training people across the state to make sure that people are informed and educated on the new voting laws. And that's first and foremost, because no matter what we're voting on, when an election is, uh, we hit our like we hit the ground running um, this year as soon as this bill was signed by the governor really getting people from all over the state to be trained on educating Ohioans on making sure that they're eligible, making sure that they're eligible to vote. Remember, today is the last day for early in-person voting. Polls open at 1 o'clock, and they will stay that way until 5 o'clock this afternoon. Tuesday is the primary special election day. Polls open on Tuesday at 6.30 in the morning. We'll certainly have more coverage of that. The debate is heating up about whether or not to hold a special August election. Earlier this week, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine told 10TV he would sign a bill to create a special election in August if the state legislature passed it. If passed, there would be a special election this August on the ballot, an amendment that would raise the threshold for passing future constitutional changes from 50 percent to 60 percent of Ohio voters. That vote would come three months before Ohioans are expected to vote on abortion rights. Wednesday, lawmakers talked about the bill on the House floor. It is so important that the voters have an opportunity to vote on raising the threshold to our Constitution to 60 percent as quickly as possible. These bills, House Bill 144 and Senate Bill 92, are specifically funding an August special election for the purpose of defeating a potential reproductive freedom initiative that could or could not be on the ballot this November. Just last year, the state legislature voted to eliminate most August special elections. This year's August election would cost $20 million. School district administrators say they are prioritizing mental health more than ever before. And this past week, legislation was introduced that would allow children to call off of school specifically for their mental health. State Representative Willis Blackshear Jr. of Dayton says three mental health days would be available as an excused absence. This is permissive, so it allows school districts to be able to excuse students, uh, whether it's for a whole day, a half day, and it can be in school or it can be uh, out of school. But the main thing about House Bill 38 is that uh, excused absences will not will not count uh, against truancy. Schools may uh, prohibit students from taking those mental health days on certain days, such as uh, testing or, or any other important days in which students need to actually be in school. This legislation does not have bipartisan support. Franklin County commissioners met with leaders this week throughout the community for their state of the county. The event at Huntington Park reviewed many of the investments made last year to support a number of different areas in need of funding. Some of that work includes investments in childcare, workforce development, and small businesses. 
Franklin County Commissioner Erica Crawley says another big focus for county commissioners this year also included affordable housing. We work with our community partners to put $50 million out on the street to uh, provide housing or to help our, our shelter centers, um, but also working with like the Affordable Housing Trust to get more developers and diverse developers into this space so they can build more units. And so you'll see this year and the years to come that we're just going to keep expanding on that work. And Franklin County leaders are also investing millions to help parents navigate the child care crisis. It's a problem we've been reporting on for months, and now commissioners say they want to do more to continue the investment into solutions for parents. 10TV's Carly Dion has more on where that money is already being used. Our child care workers are the workforce behind the workforce. It's no secret the pandemic has taken a toll on just about every industry, and the child care workforce is one of many still working to bounce back. According to a new report released today by the county, about 200 child care providers in Franklin County closed their doors in a two-year span. So if people don't have a place to put their children, then that means that they're leaving the workforce altogether or they're going to have to take time off from work. Franklin County Commissioner Erica Crawley says they invested $23 million to start a new child care initiative known as Franklin County Rise. It benefits both families and providers. We know that our child care providers were worried about keeping their doors open and the lights on and water running. We had six incentives that are still available for our providers. The funding also supports families who make too much to qualify for publicly funded child care but still can't afford child care services. Health and Human Services Deputy County Administrator Joy Bevins says some of the other incentives cover a variety of working parents' needs. Whether it's in support of housing for workers, it's scholarships for equipment and curriculum. As well as money to incentivize workers and to invest in quality child care centers. Bevin says this funding in turn will get more parents back into the workforce, supporting the economy as a whole. A lot of centers need these dollars, families need these dollars, and we really want to make sure that they take advantage of utilizing these dollars. And that was 10TV's Carly Dion reporting. Commissioner Crawley says they plan to continue to invest in these child care efforts this year to continue to help that industry get back on track. More back and forth in the battle over gun rights in Columbus. A new ruling from a Delaware County judge blocks the city of Columbus from exercising new gun restrictions. It's a reversal on a Franklin County judge's ruling earlier this year that allowed the city to move forward with a plan two years in the making. Columbus leaders want to ban large capacity magazines and require gun owners to safely store their weapons. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost released a statement calling the ruling, quote, a step in the right direction. And then there was a statement from Columbus City Attorney Zach Klein, which says in part, the city will continue to defend its ability to enact and enforce these and similar common sense gun safety reforms. We are getting a sense of how much Norfolk Southern will pay for that toxic train derailment in East Palestine. The company is attributing a nearly $400 million loss in profit. Norfolk Southern has committed nearly $31 million in compensation to the East Palestine committee, community, rather, still recovering from that. Funeral arrangements are being finalized for a former Cincinnati mayor, news anchor, and TV show host. You know him as Jerry Springer. A family spokesperson says he passed away at his home in suburban Chicago after a battle with cancer. Springer was 79 years old. The Jerry Springer show was so popular at one point it topped the Oprah Winfrey show. Before Jerry Springer was a talk show host, he had a very different role as a political leader in the city of Cincinnati. At one point, he was the 56th mayor of the Queen City. Before that, he was elected to city council, but his time in politics did not come without controversy. In 1974, he was forced to resign over a controversy involving prostitution. Engaged in activities which at least to me are questionable. In later years, Springer had unsuccessful bids for the Democratic nomination for governor, as well as a seat in the U.S. Senate. Then, in the late 80s, he got into broadcast journalism and then talk shows with the debut of The Jerry Springer Show. The program actually struggled in its first few seasons. It then underwent a complete overhaul, and by the mid-1990s, that show was known for its chaos. 
After the Jerry Springer show was canceled, Springer made numerous television appearances. At the end of his life, Springer was living at his home in Chicago. A family spokesperson says Springer had been diagnosed with cancer a few months ago. Till next time, take care of yourself and each other. His signature goodbye each night. Shockwaves sent through the airwaves. The face or faces of cable news, well, they're a changing. It was a very surprising day. I mean, you know, a lot of news was breaking between Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon. We're talking with a communications expert at The Ohio State University about what happened behind closed doors. Plus a helping hand from Central Ohio. We'll show you the conversation happening from Westerville to Ukraine. First, the race for the White House, the big topics you're going to see in 2024. Welcome back. Third District Congresswoman Joyce Beatty and 15th District Congressman Mike Carey this week announced the relaunch of the Congressional Civility and Respect Caucus. Now, you may remember this was originally established by Congresswoman Beatty and former 15th District Congressman Steve Stivers. The goal is to encourage all members of Congress to act with civility and respect in their political discourse. Well, over the next year, Beatty and Carey will visit businesses and civic organizations across central Ohio. Their goal to promote the use of respectful dialogue on challenging issues. So we will watch what happens there. Now, the race for the White House is picking up steam. This past Tuesday, President Joe Biden formally announced that he plans to seek re-election. When I ran for president four years ago, I said we we're in a battle for the soul of America, and we still are. The question we're facing is whether in the years ahead, we have more freedom or less freedom, more rights or fewer. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. Former President Donald Trump has already launched his campaign, and he's been posting videos online, like the one you see here, where he focused on homelessness and drug abuse. Our first consideration should be the rights and safety of the hardworking, law-abiding citizens who make our society function. When I'm back in the White House, we will use every tool, lever, and authority to get the homeless off our streets. We want to take care of them, but they have to be off our streets. There is nothing compassionate about letting these individuals live in filth and squalor rather than getting them the help that they need. We need professionals to help them. For a small fraction of what we spend upon Ukraine, we could take care of every homeless veteran in America. Our veterans are being treated horribly. Recent polling raises questions about the potential success of both of these candidates. This NBC News poll found most Americans do not think Donald Trump should run for president. NBC polling also found most Americans do not think President Biden should run for reelection. 10 TV's Kevin Landers is joining Face the State this morning. And Kevin, we're really glad you're joining us. Thanks you talked me. with a political analyst from Ohio State about this. I'm sure that person had a lot to say. Yeah, Professor Emeritus of Political Science Paul Beck was not surprised to see this announcement. I asked him what he thinks the big political issues will be on this election. What are, do you believe, the issues that both sides need to be hyper-focused on in order to uh, perhaps win uh, the White House in the 2024 election? Well, I think the big issue always is the state of the economy uh, and inflation being the, the immediate problem. Unemployment is down, uh, but uh, there still is persistent inflation. It's come down considerably, but you can bet that the Republicans are going, Republican candidates are going to be on attack against Biden, assuming he is going to be the, the Democratic nominee, uh, over inflation. Now, what inflation looks like a year from now will really matter. And if it's way down, that won't be much of an issue. Uh, if it is still there and, and voters are still concerned about it, it obviously uh, will be a campaign issue. In terms of, you know, the economy, everyone takes credit for it when it's doing great, but no one takes credit for it when it's going, going bit down. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think the other thing to say is that, that 
the presidents may really not have a lot of influence over the state of the economy. Uh, one needs to look at worldwide figures and inflation is, inflation is up throughout Europe, uh, particularly in Britain, but uh, in other countries as well. Now, abortion obviously is going to play a large issue in, in this campaign. When you talk to analysts about either Democrats or Republicans, mm -hmm. they seem to say that Republicans are a little bit, are backing off of the extreme measures of the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. um, because the reason is that Republicans understand that they need the independent voter. Right. And that's what Trump needed for him to win elections. And I think that they want to make sure that they don't somehow ostracize the independent voter. Now remember, Donald Trump supports abortion restrictions, but he also believes there should be exceptions for rape and incest. Mm -hmm. um, but he hasn't talked a lot about abortion recently, and a lot of Republicans um, are beginning to try to find a balance between talking about it and not being too extreme so that they don't um, ostracize some other voters. So I think it's still unknown about mm -hmm. how the abortion issue will play out in this election, but I think it's clearly going to be an issue for both candidates, whether Democrat or Republican, about how they couch what they say so that they try to get as many voters as they can into their camp. And let's talk about the other thing that uh, analysts are saying. They think that President, former President Trump is in a better place now than he was in 2016. Can you talk a little bit about what role they think the indictment might play? I think that they don't believe that the indictment is going to hurt uh, Donald Trump. I think they believe that actually um, energizes his base. Um, but I think that in terms of the indictment itself and whether or not that's going to hurt Donald Trump, I think if the, the indictments begin to stack up, mm -hmm. I think people will then start to gravitate to other candidates. DeSantis obviously would be the person most people would think about. Um, but I think that that's where it's a little bit unknown as to whether or not the indictment itself involving Stormy Daniels may not be as strong to some uh, Republicans as it would be for the other indictments that could come down as a result. So I think it's still a bit of an unknown, but I think that right now, I think Donald Trump is probably in a better spot than he was before because there are simply more candidates. And the more candidates mm -hmm. in the field, the better it is for better him. Better is for him. Yeah. All right, and he won our state by eight, point, eight percentage points yeah. in 2022. How does that figure in terms of four years later? What's the mindset? Well, I think if you look at the political map of Ohio, you see it more red than blue. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say that, that Donald Trump, if he were to be the nominee, would, would carry Ohio. Um, but I do think that Ohio is, is changing in political, its political map. It's getting more red. And I think for, for Donald Trump and other Republicans, that, that bodes well for them. All right, Kevin, thanks for joining us yep. today on Face the State. You're welcome. Well, we are going to certainly be seeing a lot of election on cable news in the coming year and a half. Two people we're not going to be seeing right there on your screen, Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon. In a surprise announcement, Fox News ousted Carlson and CNN terminated Lemon. We asked Ohio State journalism professor Nicole Kraft if she thinks the recent Fox News settlement with Dominion voting played a role in Carlson's departure. It was a very surprising day. I mean, you know, a lot of news was breaking between Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon. Um, I, I don't think that was necessary. You know, I, I actually uh, said earlier in the week that I thought that some head was going to roll. Um, I just didn't imagine it was going to be at, at that high a level. I, I don't think certainly that this case was the deciding factor in Tucker Carlson's departure. Uh, there are many other things happening behind the scenes and, and you know, some of it's come out in terms of the lawsuit that was filed uh, related to misogyny in the workplace and, um, you know, other, you know, negative factors that came potentially out of working on his staff. Um, so this seems to be something that may have been brewing for a longer period of time. The timing was certainly interesting. Uh, you know, as Brian Stelter uh, noted, the fact that he was not allowed to say goodbye to his audience in any way. I mean, that was a really bold and big statement by Fox to do that, um, that, that departure the way that they did. President Trump is As for Don Lemon, he tweeted Monday afternoon that CNN never told him directly that he was being terminated. CNN's PR account said, quote, Don Lemon's statement about this morning's events is inaccurate. He was offered an opportunity to meet with management, but instead released a statement on Twitter. You know, it can sometimes feel like the war in Ukraine is half a world away, but folks right here in central Ohio are still reaching out to help however they can. We're going to take you to Westerville when we come back. Papa 
This video from funeral services held in Ukraine, it really just highlights the human toll of the conflict there. And now people here in central Ohio are doing what they can to connect and help families in that war-torn country. 10 TV's Amy Steigerwald takes us to the Westerville Rotary Club. The Westerville Rotary Club has a strict start time for their meetings, especially one of their most recent ones, which was at 7.30 in the morning. But it was only about 3 in the afternoon in western Ukraine, which is when the Rivni Rotary Club meets. Despite being on opposite ends of the world, the two groups put their heads, or computer screens, together to figure out how they could help those who have been somewhat forgotten over the past year. This club has started numerous programs to help clothe, feed, house, even educate, and basically give folks from eastern Ukraine a semblance. Local professor Megan Chwanski set up the meeting between the two clubs. Chwanski has family in Ukraine and knows people still living in the war-torn country. She says it can be discouraging to think about how normalized the violence has become. So for me and for others in the organization, we're just trying to do whatever we can to keep Ukraine on people's minds and know that there's still a lot of need there for people who've been affected by the invasion. Really the whole community of Westerville has always jumped in to try and find ways to help. Members are working to stay connected with those they spoke with and support them in any way they can. In Westerville, Amy Stuckerwald, 10 TV News. It's all about books. Library Legislative Day was held last week at the Ohio State House. Hundreds of directors, officers, trustees, and supporters of our local libraries were there. They advocated for the importance of libraries. Governor Mike DeWine thanked librarians for all that they do for our communities. The Columbus Metropolitan Library recently celebrated a milestone with the installation of an historical marker at the new Martin Luther King Jr. branch on the Near East Side. The original building was the first public library branch in the country named after Dr. King. Growing up in this community, I remember warmth and nurturing. Nurturing from our teachers, nurturing first of all from our parents and our families. The feeling that people cared about you and wanted you to be successful. The libraries fit into that in a very major way because the libraries actually were catapulting you in a sense to learn outside of school, to actually dream for something bigger, to be a resource that was free. Any recognition for Martin Luther King or any recognition for the east side of Columbus, which has nurtured so many leaders in Columbus, excites me. I'm excited because he's really an example of what we can all strive for and should strive for. History doesn't stop, it continues. And what we've done today is we've reminded people about an important part of our past. Now let's go forth together and do great work together. One, two, three. I think a historical marker gives people information on their community, that their community matters, that they have recognition in the community. Martin Luther King's dream has far outlived him and will continue to and will inspire generations ahead of us that we will never see. Powerful. We also have this reminder today for you. This is the last day of early voting for Tuesday's primary special election. Do join us tomorrow on Wake Up CBUS. We're going to talk more about the issues on the ballot. We certainly hope to see you tomorrow and we start at 425. For now, thanks for joining us.